Hello everyone, welcome once again to Geeks Not Nerds, the podcast. I'm Captain Logan. I'm Sarah. And I'm Brandon. And today we're going to be bringing you a full hour-long podcast, maybe a little longer, who knows. Uh, we're going to be doing an entire spoiler podcast on Star Trek Into Darkness. So Brandon and I got to see the movie early. Uh, we went on Wednesday, which was really cool, and we yeah. brought you a short review that told you nothing. Except, hey, we liked this, go see it. Right. Because we didn't want to spoil anything for anybody, and because uh, we re- this was this was a movie unlike a lot of things where I really didn't even want to... There was a lot of general stuff I didn't even want to have to want That's to bring right. up. Because I was, I was afraid of giving away big, giant things. So today, um, we're going to be talking about um, all kinds of stuff. We're going to be going through um, you know you know a lot of the film. I'm talking about what we really liked about it, what we really didn't like about it. And... Um, Remember that this is, you know, obviously, it's a spoiler podcast, so if you've not seen the movie, um, don't listen to this yet, because, uh, yeah, Khan's in it. Okay, so, um... And it turns out that, turns out that this happens and this happens. <laughs> yeah, and then some, and then some things happen, and Kirk then some up, more things happen. Kirk ends up being your mom, you know, it's just a weird ending. <laughs> Uh, what I want to start with um, is, is I'd like I'd like to go uh, roundtable with with with, uh, with each of us, and um, I want you to mention uh, one thing that you were very positively surprised by, and one thing that you really wish just wasn't in the movie. See so if you can think of something. It can be big. It can be small. Just it's whatever. Be big let's for just my let's working. just start. Let's just start there. There'll be a, kind of a fun place to begin, and um, let's go ahead and start with Sarah. Okay. Um, well, let's, let me just say that my thing that I liked about it, um, surprisingly, was the actor who played Khan. Um, I don't necessarily, I, I'm very torn about the direction they took Khan himself, but I loved the guy who played him. So, um, for this Khan, this universe, this story, that guy was amazing, um, incredible actor. Um, let's see, so, thing we don't like? Yeah. Okay, thing we don't like is I don't like as doesn't much. Doesn't necessarily have to be your biggest, just something. Okay, yeah. um, one thing that I didn't like from it, it's kind of small, but it's a it's a real taste thing. Um, I did not personally like just how many fist fights everybody in the movie got into over the course of the film. There's a reason there are phasers in Star Trek. Not everyone has to get into a brawl. Just saying. Brandon. Okay, <clears throat> one thing that I really liked was. Uh, the role of Scotty in this movie. I thought that it was very, very interesting the way in which he kind of seemed to be the level head at the time when Kirk was ready to just go after this guy who killed his friend and he was willing to load up on weaponry that he knew nothing about and Scotty's like, Scotty's the one who's saying, now, whoa, 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 let, let's, let's wait on this. Like, we're not, this, this reeks of military action, not of exploration, and he's kind of, kind of the level head. Now, it works to the story that he ends up being off the ship, but <clears throat> I just, I, I really like that. One of the things that I hated in this movie was that the villain is Khan. Now, don't take that the wrong way. Benedict Cumberbatch's performance was amazing for his character. It, it, it was great. I just wish it hadn't been Khan by name. You could have called him anything else, and it would have been better for me. But I, I loved his performance, but just I, I wish it hadn't been, quote, on air quotes, on off camera. <laughs> I wish it hadn't been Khan. Now we'll, uh, we'll we'll obviously discuss all of that, but let me ask you this real, yes. real quick: Was that because you walked into the movie hoping that they weren't going to do Khan yet or at all in this universe, or was it because of the way they did it? Or both? actually, it's a little of both because <clears throat> the way that they the way that they did it, it with what they did with this character, if he had been called something else, I would have been perfectly fine with it. If they were going to do Khan. Don't do this guy, because this guy isn't Khan. The way I know Khan, this guy isn't Khan. This guy is somebody else with a different name. He's great. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But he is not Khan. And I don't think everything he does is, is un-Khan-like. No, but, that's true. But there, and, and again, we'll talk about that. There's a major fundamental 
change that just makes him an entirely different character. Uh, yes. But but yeah, we'll discuss that. I think it's also important to mention, and I should have I should have opened with this that um, the three of us on this podcast are big Star Trek fans. Yes, uh, that's part of the reason that uh, we we pulled the three of us together. And I think we might be the only three people that have ever appeared on Trek Spirits. Have we ever had anybody else in Trek Spirits besides you and I, and then Brandon yeah. a couple? I was going to say I, I know so. it. I know the three of us have been together as one. I, honestly, I, I, I think us is it. I think that's it. Yeah. So you've <laughs> got uh, so 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 you've got the the Trek Spirits, and then the only guest we've ever had on that show doing this podcast. So it is important to note that there are plenty of things that we will label as criticisms that other people aren't going to have because they don't know Star Trek. Right. Um, it's also important to note that a number of those things are because of this being a reboot out of original continuity. I said that a lot four years ago when the, when the, when the original came out, that there's, there's a lot of stuff that if only it had been a straight, full-on reboot... And they weren't using any any original canon. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be anything like as much of a problem as it is. Right. So we'll we'll discuss those things. Um, okay. So uh, the thing I liked the most about it uh, was uh, thematic. Uh, I thought this movie was it, first of all it told a story, um, and I know that sounds really silly. I, I'm not saying there's no story in the first movie, but I feel like in, in well, the, my biggest complaint about the about the first one was it was kind of all concept and all conceit and all let's get the ball rolling and I didn't feel like the ideas were there. I feel like the ideas are there this time. Um, and for some Trekkies are complaining, it's still not to the degree they want it. Honestly, I kind of didn't expect anything. It was it, it was really exciting to get to see not just the relationship stuff. I mean, like the friendship stuff with with Spock and Kirk and stuff that 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 was there in the first movie and that they were building that that really paid off this movie and that I really bought those two becoming friends that were very different and butted heads, but they became friends. All of that is. Where Working, is working really well, but even beyond that, the bigger Star Trek ideas are much more present this time, and so we get a little bit of uh, political and social commentary with especially the um, the idea of uh, military organiza organization versus an explorational kind of organization, and uh, I, I feel like it has something to say about... Um, uh, about kind of our modern day cynicism of you know realistic means dark and edgy, and I like that a movie called Star Trek Into Darkness that a lot of us were afraid was going to be too dark of a film, trying to do like the Nolan Star Trek, was actually kind of preaching again. Not preaching, that's a bad word because I don't think it was preachy, but I but I think that the message was actually a little bit against that. And that just excited me to the core. It's such an optimistic film, and I cannot believe that I'm saying that. Because I felt like the first one wasn't. Here, I felt like they got what Starfleet's supposed to be. They got the ideals. They understood the Prime Directive. Holy crap. They knew what that was, and they did it right. Um, anyway, I got really excited about all of that. Um, a lot of... There's a lot of things I could go to uh, uh, for negative, especially some... Uh, some canonical stuff that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so what I'm trying to I'm trying to decide which one to, to, to mention now because most of it was stuff that just didn't didn't you know bother me that much. But I think my biggest one is is also Brandon's biggest one, um, Con. And I guess what I'll say is um, I wanted to find out at the end that it was one of the other 72 just masquerading as Khan. I thought that would have been really, really cool. And I'm not saying that, like, oh, no, the movie didn't do it my way. It's just that that would have explained a lot of things that don't make sense. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. So, I don't know. We can, we can talk about some of that. But it's just bizarre that Khan is British. Why is Khan British? I guess my I, I guess I guess maybe my biggest complaint is that um, our two characters that are brought into this movie that already existed in the other universe are of the wrong nationalities, mm -hmm. um, or at least they have the wrong accents. Why, do, why is Khan British... And why is um, Carol Marcus Australian? Especially because her father has an American accent. Hmm. I don't. I don't understand that. Anyway, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into all of that stuff. So um, why don't we? Since we're since we're kind of dodging around it, let's start hmm. with Khan. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Well, my biggest problem with Khan, other than the fact that y yeah, he's British, and that's just weird. Um, hmm. I could. See, with me, I could see him, since, you know, Ricardo Montemont wasn't exactly an Indian Sikh himself. No, he didn't even look at it at all, yeah. <laughs> no, but <laughs> Khan was supposed to be, um, have an Indian background. I mean, he was mm. supposed to be Indian. Like, I'd have felt better if at least they'd mentioned it. Yeah, I, I would be okay if he had just some foreign, you know, you couldn't really place it accent. Um, not necessarily British or Australian. 
rather than, or if they'd gone all the way and said, well, he's supposed to be Indian, well, let's make him Indian. I, I would have been happier if they'd gone one of those two ways. Personally, I would have even been more okay with just, well, this is the actor we want, and he's not going to fake an accent, so we'll just say one thing and do another. I would have even been more okay oh, with yeah. that. Yeah. I would have even been more okay with just, um, that guy's Indian. And then we in the audience, well, no, he's not. Yeah. But you sort of had that or with Monobon. Or just dressed him up like yeah. it or something. I don't or know. Or at least we saw, I, I would have, because the thing is, you can't dress him up like it because he's supposed to look like a, a covert ops guy working That's for Section true. 31. Mm -hmm. That's all fine. <laughs> they could have even built in, he's faking a British accent because he works for Section Thirty One yeah. and he lives in London. They could have they could have built all that in. Yeah, that's true. Um, but I do think that it would have been cool if at least we'd gotten to see like a picture of Cumberbatch, like when Khan was from, in, out of from the Eugenics Wars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would have been very interesting. Why does nobody ever? I'm sorry. Why does nobody ever look up his dossier mm -hmm. in this movie like they do in in uh, Spacey? Space yeah. Well, they th to. Nobody they, checks on his identity. They, they don't check into it that far, but Spock has a line indicating that he did look up the history of this particular con in this movie. Really? He has a line where he says, he, where he basically says that he looked up his history, as where he says that he was a genocidal maniac. Was he? Um, the thing is, all, uh, Spock. I don't remember Spock actually looking up anything in the databanks. They didn't just show call, him. He just call, no. All he does is call up Leonard Nimoy, Spock, and ask him who that guy is. That may be. Hmm. That that may be so. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure what you're talking about, unless I missed something. I I seem I to get. I okay, seem okay. to get the idea that he'd done more than that. But since we don't actually see the full extent of their conversation no, on camera, that may be actually right. the case. Genocide is mentioned, and we need to talk about that because that's huge. Right. Yeah. Uh, the idea of Khan um, uh, being having having uh, committed genocide is mentioned, but it's not by Spock. It's by either the admiral or Kirk. I don't remember. Um, I think. I think maybe it's the admiral that mentions. I forget. No, but the, he has a he has a scene. Uh, Spock has a scene on the bridge of the Enterprise with Khan on the other ship, where he says something. Well, about he, that. maybe he got it from Leonard Nimoy, who already right. isn't remembering Khan. Exactly. Correctly. No, I, um, I, I I might agree with that. Yeah. Because I hadn't considered that. Sarah. Why should Khan not be a genocidal maniac? Well, because he never committed genocide in the Prime Universe, and. I don't know, it's just weird to me. This this con is so different um, from the original, and it's not really a problem, except, like you said, they rebooted it out of prime but continuity. There's, there's no reason real reason for him to be this different. That's No, that's the I, I think the, not at all. the yeah. problem is that way back during the eugenics wars, um, Spawn was one of... Spawn? Sorry. <laughs> Khan, was, Khan was one of... Um, <laughs> you can tell what's on my mind. That was okay, one of, the best thing ever. I fell asleep watching Spawn here. Okay. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. He was one of... The other day I fell asleep watching Spawn. Oh. <laughs> he was one of 20 dictators um, controlling the planet Earth. Yeah. And... Mm -hmm. um, he was actually one of the more benevolent ones. And Khan by himself, I, th I think, had like a third of the world by himself. He had a third of the world by himself, and he was trying to control as much of the world as he could. And uh, when he got forced to go off in the, in the Botany Bay and, and be frozen, I mean, that was the end of his reign. But he, he was never genocidal. He was very, very ambitious and very, very power hungry. And sure, he, I could see him. I'm sure he's responsible I mean, for some he's, deaths. He's killed mm -hmm. people, but he didn't commit any mass murders under his reign. And certainly not genocide. Certainly not genocide. And this con seems to just kill people because they're bugs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's different. And again, if he, if it were a full-on reboot and they went, our version of Khan was a genocidal maniac, I couldn't argue with it. Right. That'd be fine with me. What? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> but you're right. They've got Leonard Nimoy from original continuity who comes straight from original continuity in this timeline. And who's doesn't now saying, remember, right, who's remember Khan correctly. giving us a different backstory of Khan in his own universe, and that's just not... What he what he comes on and does is what what uh, what Nimoy comes on and says is uh, Khan will not hesitate to kill everyone on that ship. Right. That's not really it's Khan. Not true. Uh, That's if not you true, remember yeah. back to Space Seed, he had the opportunity to kill everyone on the bridge. Yeah. And he didn't. He put them to sleep, and then he woke them up and tr and said, "Hey, work for me." Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Khan wants to rule people. He has he has a moral code. He has a particular moral code. He's more interested in. 
um, being everybody's ruler than he is in just killing people because they, I mean, like, you know, if they don't agree with them and he can't get them, one second. If he doesn't, uh, you know, if people don't agree with him and he can't get them to do what he wants and they're going to oppose him, then yeah, maybe he'll kill them, sure. Right. Uh, and, but that, but he that's certainly con. has the capacity he's, to do so. Yeah, and, and he sees himself as, I, I would even argue that he sees himself as a force for good, that Khan thinks that he's the better man. Yeah, so he should, he should be in charge. He, he yeah. should And that's what was interesting about, what was interesting about Khan was that he wasn't Hitler. Yeah. That he wasn't Stalin, that he wasn't exactly. one of those guys. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was said that, unusually, um, for the history of dictators, he didn't cause massive deaths. You know, yeah. he, he didn't massacre. And this movie comes right out and contradicts that and says that mm -hmm. he, he was genocidal. Um, anyway, I don't want to belabor the point. It doesn't kill the movie by any stretch of the imagination. Right. He's just a different person. And that's just a little bit difficult for me because, again, he's supposed to be the one that we knew. And what I don't like is that it makes me feel like the guys that wrote the movie, or um, 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 Kurtzman and Orsi and Lindelof, um, that, that, and, and Abrams, that they don't really get Khan. They don't have a perfect understanding of who Khan is. It would have been better had he had been revealed that he was one of the, like you said, one of the other 72 masquerading that would have been As great Khan. for me. I mean, I'm not sure. That would have been you, a good reveal too. I'm not sure how you could have done it um, believably. I mean, I was thinking that in the theater. One of the things that got me through it um, with Khan, where I kept going, "Ah, oh, he's so different from, from from the real Khan." The movie was so good that I kept thinking, "I think they're they're gonna they're gonna give us something." Like I like I like. Well, I, you thought that they were gonna continue with the surprising us one I more did. time, and so. But the reason the reason I don't think you could have done it is because. Why? All you have to do is go look at the history books and see what he looks like, and surely yeah. the admiral would have done that. Yeah. Um, Sarah, one thing you you wondered about when we were talking about this yesterday was why um, Khan, or why the admiral, uh, or how the admiral, excuse me, figured out uh, which of the pods had Khan in it. Yeah, I mean, either he guessed. Are they labeled? I didn't know if because it, it doesn't say that he specifically went to wake up Khan. I don't suppose. I mean, I, I was wondering... No, nah, he acted like it was really deliberate yeah, about it. it, it yeah. And again, definitely... we've seen it twice, you've only seen it yeah. once, but that's something I picked up on the second yeah. time. Yeah. It, was, was, it seemed really deliberate, where it was like, well, the, I don't really want to go wake up Khan, but I feel like this is this is necessary for my military vision of the future. He said, I took a tactical risk in waking up Khan. Me, and that, to me, said that he, he was looking for the guy who was in charge of, of these people, and, and yeah. he so figured it out. So his pod was either labeled or he had a photo, I, I, you know, a photo from the history mm -hmm. books trying to match them up. I think that this being the way that they retell Botany Bay is a fantastic idea. I love the notion that uh, Khan gets found earlier because they start exploring out around Earth a, a, a lot a lot more and kind of scouring just to see what's there because of the destruction of Vulcan. Um, that was a cool concept. That's a great idea. And and I think that it was executed pretty well. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean like like what Khan ended up being I, I, I thought was I thought was a little bit was a little bit strange, but then how they how they got him out, the actual admiral, the whole section thirty one bit mm -hmm. It was one name drop, but it was a big thing it for me as a Trekkie. Cool. I was really yeah. glad that Section Thirty One was mentioned, and I felt like had the had it just been the leader of Starfleet is kind of kind of going nuts and is all militaristic, and people and, and people are following him um, would have been kind of hard to swallow. But the fact that he's also running Section Thirty One, which is which, as we know from DS Nine, has been there since the since since, since the original Starfleet Charter, mm -hmm. um, and they do. Co crazy covert things trying to keep the peace in the Federation, uh, that made it work for me. So I was yeah. really glad we had that. That did bring a lot, that did tie a lot of it together, and you couldn't you couldn't have done a movie like this without some sort of covert ops going on, and Section 31 was the perfect way to do that. And I, I thought that when, when they did drop that name that it was Section 31, it hadn't occurred to me that that could have been Section 31, but I mean, that was that was just really... A, a neat thing, and a really good way to get the optimism of of, uh, of the Trek universe in this thing. Finally, um, ultimately, you get to the end, and I mean, I don't know where they're going to go from here, but it's like we've got a more optimistic Star Trek future in a certain way than we ever have before. Hear me out, because we just took out Section Thirty One. That's crazy. Yeah, 
I mean, like, we're going to go <laughs> on to the five-year mission, and we've, we've taken Starfleet to the brink of despair and almost turned it into a pure military organization, made it... And I thought, I think the parallel was supposed to be that, that we're going to make... We could get it back to being as bad as things were during the eugenics wars. That yeah. if this goes this far and we become this military, we could start an internal civil war. You know what I mean? Like, like we could we could get that far. It could be terrible. Right. Um, at the same time, the admiral has a little bit of a point. He just goes too far, and so that's, that's true. all. That's all interesting. But then, but what I was going to say is, you get to the end. We got rid of that guy, and I think we blew up Section Thirty One, and so like now we're like. It's like like the future looks really positive now. The future I just looks think that's really interesting. The future looks really positive, and also Section Thirty One is now something that can be seen by people who aren't in Section Thirty One. You're, you're exposing it, but yeah. of course, Star Trek has a history of being this uh, this uh, this benevolent. We come in peace. Let's go exploring, and then at the same time, there are those dark roots where we do have a little military action in us, and I think this The question always this. being, is bureaucracy necessary? Right, and so I think that this movie explores that in a really interesting way, and as far as as far as this being a good movie, I will say this, because I haven't mentioned this yet, I, I did really enjoy this movie as a movie and as Star Trek. I really enjoyed it, and I think this is almost exactly what we needed in order to get us from the first movie to actual Trek movie, like... A, a, like a great Trek movie, you know what I mean? What do you think about what that? What I'd like to see is um, it go to series, <laughs> television series after oh, this. I, I, be I, think that would, I think that would be the perfect send-off. For they it. set it up. They, they, they set it up for that five-year mission. Yeah. Um, I think I enjoyed this as a movie, and it was certainly better than I expected it would be. Um, as Star Trek, there were, there were still things missing from it for me. Um, what were the biggest ones? Well, the the feel is just off, um, in just as I it's hard for me to accept this crew as the original series crew, and that's just a personal my mind can't get wow, around it. Wow, that's interesting. Thing. I had a lot less of that this time. I, yeah, I me did too. too, but it's still hard. Um, another thing is their technology never seems to work the way it's supposed to, so they can't beam. Anybody anywhere under any circumstances? And I know some people. Probably, much. I gotta say this. I know some people are probably gonna comment and say, "Well, that was that was always true of Star Trek." Not to this no, degree, though. Not this to is this ridiculous. degree. Ridiculous. Like there's there's too much heat. We can't beam through the heat. It, that like, guy's running. We can't beam yeah, him we, up. Like they're, they're moving. We can't differentiate. Well, I can almost understand we can't differentiate between Doctor McCoy's arm and the torpedo. I can understand I that. that. It, it's shielded. They couldn't even see what was oh, inside. Oh, it was. I'm sorry. You're yeah, right. I forgot so all about I, that. I can get that. But mm -hmm. then when they're talking about they're moving around down there. I can't get a lock on them. They're on top of a big metal thing that's the only thing floating in air. Like, we Yeah, well, why don't you get the wonder kid out from <laughs> engineering because I know. he He's was able to one. beam Kirk through all kinds of stuff while he was plummeting toward his death. So, yeah, the first yeah. one. That's something I have to mention that I really absolutely enjoyed about this movie was the mix-up of people's what, what they're used to doing and what they're thrown into doing in this movie. I thought that was great. Ch like, giving them different positions... And kind of showing what they can do. Uh, see, my problem with that is that there are supposed to be what 130 people in the ship. Something I like thought that. I thought the original Enterprise had closer to like 400. Oh, you're right. You're right. There should Maybe have been like another engineer. You're talking first of like all. But, so Enterprise. There, so there, yeah. yeah. So there are several hundred people on this ship. Yeah. There would be an engineer exactly. under Scotty. I know that. So why is Chekhov down there? He flies the ship. I un I understand that. I really get that. But at the same time, I liked I. I it, it didn't really work necessarily, no, but I, 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 like the, couldn't fix it. I like the, Here's the, the transposition. I don't think we. It, I think you're you're looking at two of them, and you're saying that everybody got swapped around. That, that's not, not what happened. Um, I, but I see what you're saying. I think everybody got something cool to do, with the exception of Chekhov, because it was ludicrous. I, I didn't like that part. I thought that was a silly idea, yeah. and I thought it, yeah. it, it, it it reeked of we don't know what to do with Chekhov. Um, that's true. I thought that uh, everybody else, for the most part, got cool things to do. Um, having the the only other one that fits what you're saying is Sulu, and that was one scene where he gets to be captain for a minute, and that's one of the best scenes of the movie. That is one of the best. I scenes. loved that bluff. That was so cool. That was such a great bluff, and then uh, Doctor McCoy's comment was great too. I, that was a good scene for me. Uh, that's there is some 
outstanding dialogue in this movie. Yeah. There's some fantastic writing. And I would argue, Sarah, some very Star Trek writing. I, I thought what I, I thought what Sulu said there was was spot on. Yeah, there were definitely scenes that were very, very Star Trek. And then there were other scenes for me that were very not. Uh, especially like I like I said earlier, all the all the fist fights. Yes, you generally get fist fighting in original series episodes between Kirk and some and the random bad guy, and then he you know he takes him down with a double flying kick. <laughs> right. But we didn't. That's not the kind of. That's a. That's, that's not a the kind of brawls we got. Punch we got, him up, drag him down, fight in in Star Trek. That uh, we're not. I mean, he might have done that with Finnegan, right? Yeah, he did it with Finnegan, but, but also he didn't have it. any weapons with him. With I know, Finnegan. but that's about. I'm just Usually, saying. when somebody gets in a fist fight in this movie, they're also armed with a phaser. Yeah, Man, I, I, just, I don't get. I don't get why we just didn't get the phaser usage as much. We had I we know. had a couple key spots where, especially, all I guess the only time they used him was at Khan. And was that a phaser uh, rifle Klingons. that he and the Klingons. had? Yes, that that looked like a phaser rifle to me. Sure. Does that fit with the time frame? Yeah, yeah, we had phaser rifles in TOS. Okay, they I, just look different. I wasn't sure. I, I than the ones for some reason. No, we, no we had phaser rifles okay. in TOS. Sure. <clears throat> I'm not sure what they called them, but we did have them. And what was the, just just as I'll show curiosity, you a picture after the show. Just just out of curiosity, <laughs> what was that thing that he wrapped around that phaser rifle? Was that a fire hose? Like seriously, what came out of the wall when he's pulling that thing out of the oh, wall? Oh, I don't know what that. I think it was a fire hose. I maybe. think it was too, like a fire control, like the fire suppression system. And but th- that's another thing. That was that was one of the best reveals. This this movie had a lot of great reveals in terms of the ship. And just some things that happen, like the the scene where they're all sitting there at the table having that conference about what to do in this situation, and Kirk comes to the conclusion, like, we're all, this is like exactly where we're supposed to be. And then that light comes in, and they're like, they took a little bit long to hit the deck. I will say yeah. that. Yeah. Like, there's you see that, he gee, there's all that, this red in the room, what the, should we do? He comes to that conclusion, and then you see this laser red light And then he says, in. clear the room, and you're like, yeah, that took a little that long. That took about ten seconds too long. Yeah, see, I would have figured that would have saved more people. Yes. If it, because he, he came up with it right before Good it happened. Good point. Yes. I like, <clears throat> tell, Sarah, tell me if you agree with this. Um, I know Brandon will. Yeah. I, I like how much ingenuity we see from Kirk in this I, movie. I appreciated yeah. that, too, in a big way. I thought it was cool. I thought that was really, really um, nice. I feel for our main hero here. I guess I guess both of them. Guess Spock does too. But I mean, like Spock gets stuff to do. But but I but I feel like um you, you know Kirk is supposed to be the you know think on his feet, take risks, figure stuff out real quick, and make something happen. In I get why he shouldn't probably be a captain yet yeah. and I appreciate that they yeah. delved into that but at the same time he's got instincts and we get to actually see great great examples of him using those yes. and we get we also get to see him his thought process near the end where he's like I know what I can do and I kind of know what the Enterprise needs right now and the Enterprise needs you sitting up there but he's like I know what I can do I'm going with my gut feeling here and I'm going to do it because I, I know I can do this I thought that was really cool. Yeah, but I think the problem is that Kirk has plenty of instincts, and that's why Pike thought he would be great in Starfleet anyway. Yeah. But if you combine, if you were to combine instincts plus some training, just think how much better he could be. Exactly. Yeah, and, and it's honestly kind of more Pike and Starfleet's fault that he is so wet behind the ears and out in space. Yeah, because mm-hmm. he, he really he shouldn't be. I mean, even after you know, kind of saving the universe in the first movie, that doesn't automatically mean that it makes sense to go to be sent out on yeah, survey he, missions. He didn't even complete no. the, his training at the academy. He, he was there three years. What would have worked better? What What would have worked better in in a real sense is that Pike would have requested that he be. Like high in command under his under his command. Sure, more like, like of an in, like an internship almost. I I won't go so far as to say a Wesley Crusher of the Enterprise, but it's similar in nature. That's no, what would have no. made more sense. That would be Chekhov in this universe. <laughs> um, but but I I'm mostly yeah. kidding. Uh, but, 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 <laughs> but you're not. But I feel like um, one of the coolest lines in the whole movie, and maybe it's just because I I loved this movie, admitting that it was a little silly the first movie how quickly uh, Kirk got promoted to captain and, and all of that. When Pike says we're sending you back to the academy, that was an I was very excited line. about that. And also um, the, later on. <laughs> 
It was cool, by the way, that the movie had so much breathing room that they took their time to set things up and to make things feel like they were happening organically. That was yes. something we didn't get as much in the first movie. I felt like most of the action, maybe for some people's taste, it's too much of an action movie, but I did feel like most of the action in this movie, even if you think it, it it's too long, there's too much of it, at least serves the story for the most right. part. It does it does in, in in my mind anyway. And and I thought it was it was great that um for instance we don't have both of those pieces of information in the same scene. You're we're sending you back to the academy and then you'll be my first officer. Right. That that that, that we get that later. Right. That's true. But also you talk about setting things up in this movie, we get a payoff for anything they set up in this movie. Yeah, exactly. And that that to me is moving forward than what we got to see kind of in the last movie. We didn't have real... We didn't have the kind of payoffs we should have had from certain things in the first movie, whereas we're, we're getting all sorts of payoffs in this movie that really work. And I, I want to I touch on this, speaking of payoffs. They, they work a lot in the first half of the movie on the Kirk and Spock relationship, so to speak. And then in the second half, we get kind of the introduction of the third part of what we all know as the three of them, where we get McCoy, he's kind of introduced into their three-part triangle, you know, and I really enjoyed that play and the, the payoff that we got there. I thought that there were, and you know, people have heard me harp over and over again on, I, I miss the triad, that's what TOS was about, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, right. wh where is it? Um, I love that there are a couple of key scenes where the triad is there, kind of. Right. I, I'm not convinced that they've set us up so that that's now the formula moving forward. I, I'm, I'm not I I'm not sure that getting into a next one that McCoy, that they will find as much for McCoy to do as I think they ought to. Um, right. I, he, he was still underutilized here, but not like he was in the first one. Right, exactly. This in, in the first one, in the first one, they were more interested in giving him classic McCoy lines. Yeah. I'm positive about that. And while he had a few right. here, yeah. they worked well here. And I, I like how... All Kirk, the classic lines here work because they're not hitting you in the head with them every five minutes. That's right. And then Kirk tells him, quit it with the metaphors. Like, what's up with that? I thought yeah, that and, was kind of funny. And McCoy gets more to do besides just making metaphors. Right, and, yeah. and just being a doctor. I mean, he gets to basically operate on a piece of machinery. I thought that was cool. I thought cool. that was a really cool scene. And, yeah. and he, he, he played, uh, the guy who plays him, Carl That's Urban. That's actually a callback to Undiscovered Country. Right, Carl, Carl Urban, right? That's yeah. his name. The guy who plays him, I, I thought, pulled out a masterful performance as Bones in this movie. It, it, it was one of my favorite things about this. I think everybody was uh, really... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I thought all of the performances were solid, most of them better than the first movie, and mm -hmm. also uh, they gelled really well with the first movie. No, Nobody felt like, well, well, this movie's coming out four years later, so all of a sudden they've changed their performance. I mean, like, they, it, it was all consistent, I thought. It was, it was yeah. very consistent, um, but it, it's also like, uh, it, we, we've had some time, of course, between the two movies, but this just felt like they had kind of become comfortable with with each other over their missions that they had in the meantime, and where we oh, yeah, pick it up enough. at the very be where we pick it up at the very beginning, it's like they've they've come to this this part where all of a sudden it's like it's kind of working now. Yeah, and you don't feel like when they when they go to stop that volcano, that's the first mission they've ever been on. Right, it's like they're actually working together as an ensemble crew. Whatever you might think of that volcano scene, and we'll talk about it because <laughs> Sarah's got about twenty five issues with it. Uh, we'll, 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 I, when we get to the end, yeah, and and some of them are hilarious. But okay. <laughs> by the way, I want to tell everybody when we get to the end to the end of the podcast after we've knocked out the really big things, just for fun, we're gonna throw out some little nitpicky things that we thought of just because not that they bring all the, the whole movie down, but just because there's some silly things that are kind of fun to bring up. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so the. Uh, it was really cool to do that volcano scene at the beginning because my biggest complaint about the first movie is it's called Star Trek and they don't go anywhere. And yeah. this movie opens with a mission and they went someplace and yeah. it's not right in the middle of the Federation. And and we're actually in the middle of the mission and we get to kind of figure it out as it's going along. Yeah, and that's a great story thing too. Uh, open, opening, uh, you, you know, you know, a lot of people tell you open um, in Midas Rest. That means in the middle of the action. Right. What a lot of people um, do with that that I think is always a bad idea is they'll open in midis res meaning you don't know what you're looking at it's in the middle of the movie and then they flash back to it's like a flash forward and then they start 
uh, somewhere closer to the beginning right after that. Right. This is actual real in Matus Ras. It's, yeah. it's, we don't need to know everything about this mission right away because it's, um, because it's not that complicated. But then we get to the end of it, and it actually has everything to do with the movie. And yeah. I was really excited about that. You've got Spock trying to sacrifice himself before Kirk will later. There's some fantastic parallelism going on there. We need to talk about the role reversal with Kirk and Spock. We'll do that in a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought that the way they set that all up, proving to us that they know what the Prime Directive is, exactly. and and that um, and that uh, Kirk is uh, being yanked off of his command because he won't follow rules right and it becomes a movie about rules and about the law what, yeah. um, a few a few early reviews I read were complaining that a lot of the ideas in this movie are just kind of ripped from other Star Trek things and that, that did them better and that um, it doesn't have a it doesn't have any cohesive thing to say on its own I disagree I with disagree that. with that too because that's what Star Trek is in a sense is it, 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 Star Trek is a lot about these rules and how in the future we'll deal with handling these types of situations. The, the point I'm making is there are a lot. I read things that said like <laughs> there's a lot of platitudes from Star Trek that are just thrown in there. They're not ever done anything with. No, this movie has a cohesive narrative and thematically yes. it is about. <clears throat> rules and laws and what we do with them uh, both both when should we follow them when should we not follow them mm -hmm. um, how how many is too many and why do we make them and what are they about all of that is a very important thing to discuss in this day and age and I thought it was fantastic because it was so optimistic at the end yes. um, should, anyway should we do the expedient thing should we do the right thing mm -hmm. and um, I, yeah. I, I loved uh, Spock's line about there is no rule in Starfleet that condemns a man to die without a trial and isn't it cool that at the beginning, Spock is about to die for an ideal. The, the difference between Kirk and Spock at the beginning is that Kirk will die for a person, and he doesn't know it yet, yeah. because he doesn't believe he'll ever be put in that situation. That's what's so great about Kirk, is that is that he, remember from from uh, from other things, I don't believe in the no-win scenario, right? Yeah. And that's Wrath of Khan. Right. Um, here, we get, uh, we get Kirk, he will, and we get this at the end, too, uh, Kirk will die for a person. Spock will die for an ideal. But very quickly, each of them is starting to understand the other person's viewpoint, and then the other person's worldview is helping them make choices. So right. Spock, um, very early in the movie, has to say, well, my morality actually trumps the rules. And for, for Spock that early to have to say, no, I will not blindly follow orders is really, really good stuff, yeah. and very Star Trek. And that's why, um, regardless of my continuity, my, my, mostly my issues are continuity things, because those things are there, I will happily call this Star Trek. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you on that. I will, I will agree with you on that, for sure. And I just I didn't feel like that stuff was too thin. I thought that it was that, that it was that it was there. It was handled well, and it made and it made me think about yeah, things. I, I and I like, want Star Trek that makes me think. Yeah, and I felt I like, like I got that. This was with a this movie, movie of ideas as opposed to the first one that had big. It had big ideas. Ideas, yeah, plot wise, it had, it had ideals, but it never met them. Yeah, I'm not really saying it's just very I'm, much, and I'm not saying this is an ultra deep film by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying that it did make me think about some things. There is some commentary there. It's an action movie with some commentary in it, and it's pretty cohesive. I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. At least the plot is cohesive. At least we know the villain's motivations which is a big one for me. At least it wasn't, oh, the Earth is in danger, it's going to be blown up, we have to stop it from being from exploding. And like a really easy, flimsy motivation of, well, this guy's mad at someone, so he's going to blow everything up. We, we didn't have that this time. Yeah, thank goodness. I, I would kind of uh, like, I, I would have liked him to have given us a little more backstory on the guy from Section 31 that blows up the place. I would have liked that. I I thought it was an interesting. Inset. I do think he's over the top. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. He's he is a pretty flamboyant kind of villain, and it, it, flamboyant's not the right word, but you know what I, you know what I mean. Where like you're talking about the admiral. Yeah, he's pretty darn extreme, and and it's it's a little bit strange that he's kind of the only one. You know what I mean? Well, like he's ultra ultra extreme because of what happened to Vulcan in the first movie, but like. The only reason anybody is following him, as far as I can tell, is because he's so powerful. He yeah. reminded me a little bit of the Vulcan leader from Enterprise. Well, and I could see him being convincing, a, a little where, bit. especially after the destruction of Vulcan. Sure. Thinking that 
Starfleet must be military, we have no choice, or Earth might be next. But what's strange is that he's working really covertly, and he hasn't really brought that message to the Federation as the whole yet, mm -hmm. uh, on the whole yet, mm -hmm. and then simultaneously he's building this big giant spaceship that he's going to have to unveil to people at some point. But he, surely he would have been unveiled it after the war with the Klingons started. Good yes. point. So you're saying he would have he's, been like... he's going to let everybody keep thinking that Earth can remain a utopia. Yes. And then... And then and then it'll be clear that, oh, Earth cannot remain a utopia right, with the this outside threat. I forgot. There's that great thing where he wants to force a war with the Yeah, Klingons. basically. And remember, he even says, well, war with them is inevitable. That's going to happen. That's his foreshadowing. Yeah. He's like, if you ask me, son, war has already begun. And I, I Basically, that line. And I like that line. And he's, he's like, war is coming to and the Federation. And what, un what unsettled me in the theater... And then, of course, it ends up making perfect sense, and it, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be unsettled. Is I'm watching Star Trek, and the most and the, and the biggest uh, uh, captains and admirals in the Starfleet are sitting around a table, and a guy says, "I'm going to send out a ship to go kill a guy," and nobody bats an eye. It's it's already That's begun. That's scary. Yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's, it's already, already started. Begun. Yeah, forget what I said earlier. No, it's there. And anyway, I was impressed with all of that. Yeah, me they too. They made me believe it. Um, this is this is real strange. It was weird. It's almost like TOS with some DS9 in it, hmm. and not just because of Section Thirty One. I mean, the ideas of of um of of do you have to have some corruption in order to have order? That DS9 is all about that. Yeah. In a lot of places, and we don't get as much of that in TOS. That's yeah. true. No, we we do have some, you know, corrupt there are people. Rogues. <laughs> there are there are rogues. There are more incompetent admirals than yes. than and just a whole evil ones. Planet. But yeah, yeah, and then about and then about six Earth-like planets that some crazy captain went off and created because he was a rogue with bizarre ideas. But it's yeah. not really so much about corruption versus utopia and the balance like DS9 is. I don't yeah. think we really get... That, that, ideal, that idea is not played but this, with. But this, I think it's great to do it with the TOS crew. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, but this, this movie is trying to... This guy is basically trying to take the intellect of a man who's... Who, according to this universe... Who, who, this guy who is old, he's trying to take this intellect of a man and try to... He's trying to create... It's kind of a mismatch because he's trying to take a man who was so bent on domination yeah and then and trying forcing to work to, for him and forcing him to work for him dominating a man who was bent on domination and then trying to dominate on top of that and create your own war so that you can come out on top of them mm -hmm. it's just it it's it goes down and down yeah, in some ways that seems like a comic book plot, a classic comic book kind plot of. where yeah. you wake up somebody that you expect to be a henchman <laughs> Only he ends up being more powerful than you and yeah. helps you take over the world and then takes over you. Um, I, I may get some flack when I say this from folks. Again, I think Cumberbatch's uh, performance is amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I, absolutely. And I don't dislike um, his motivations and what he does. I think what he does makes perfect sense. He's just not quite Khan. We've talked about that. But the thing I'm going to say that might annoy some people is Khan in this is basically a gun that somebody points. Um, and that's not a problem, but I think that a lot of people keep talking about, with this movie, especially doing non-spoiler reviews, you know, the villain, the villain, the villain, the villain. Mm -hmm. Khan's not the villain of this movie. He's not. No. Um, Khan is a gun somebody points someplace, and I think that's cool, because it's like, we're going to wake up this guy, and we're going to make him work for us, but you can't control Khan. He's, it's he's, not going to work. He's so, almost exactly what he is, a piece of technology. The point, I, well, but he's more complex than that. He is. I wish he was even more complex than he is. Yes, uh-huh. Uh, but um, the... the uh, I guess I guess the point I'm trying to make is there are a lot of people that are complaining that Khan doesn't get enough cool evil bad guy stuff to do. I think people are missing that the bad guy plot is not Khan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now he does he does try to take over at the end, but you want that he's Khan. You know what I mean? So I mean that's 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 fine. Um, I know you got issues with it, and we can talk about that. But I'm just saying that that at least we have a Khan that attempts to take control at the end. I, I'm glad yes. that we have that. Um, Maybe it's more he's trying to blow up people. I think it's more that he's trying to blow up people because his he thinks that his 72 uh, crew members have died at that point. And so what does he do? He crashes his ship into the Federation or the uh, Starfleet headquarters. 
Now, and then he just runs off. We don't know what he's going to do. No, but but that doesn't mean that he's just suddenly on a crazy revenge initiative. He could try to take over the planet. Well, like, that's he, that's a good that's starting great. place. But it's but also a good starting place for a revenge initiative. That's okay, very I'm interesting. I'm glad we're not told in a way because well, sure, at least, but yeah, I, yeah. But we just don't. We just don't know. He mentions that he was basically. I would accept that more if. Leonard Nimoy's character if Leonard Nimoy's Spock hadn't come on screen to say that he was he'll he'll kill at the drop of a hat because that's not who he was then mm -mm. but to say that but it, it's very true he says Khan says that he was responding in kind so that was my family they were taken away from me I had every reason to expect they were dead what would you do I was responding in kind I would have accepted that hook, line, and sinker right there if they hadn't gone and said, tried to tell us that he was like that in the original continuity, too. Precisely, because they didn't need to. Right. Um, because because, because that in and of itself actually has much more of a, of a, of a real revenge motive right. that, that I can buy. I don't know if you do, Sarah, mm -hmm. than, than any revenge villain we ever had past Wrath of Khan in Star Trek right. movies. Okay? Right. Yeah. Um, when, when he's... Um, when he's going after the Admiral at the beginning, when he tries to blow up the room full of captains and admirals, when um, when he does everything he does before his he, he actually thinks his people have been destroyed, that's not revenge, that's desperation. Right. And I like the idea of let's, let's kind of circumvent everybody's expectations and put Khan in a place of desperation. What would Khan do mm -hmm. if he was desperate to save his family? Right. And then they do some nice parallels with uh, that and Kirk and Spock and what would Kirk do for his crew. And so now um, you have not a Kirk wants, or, or Khan wants revenge on Kirk, but more of Kirk, Kirk and Khan actually are very similar in a lot of ways. But K Khan wants revenge on the Federation at yeah. this point. Yeah, by the end. Exactly. And I, I think that's cool. But like I said, like... That that works if you don't give us if you don't tell us he was a genocidal fool in original continuity because you don't need it you yeah. don't that's need my point. it at the all. same the, the same con could do basically everything he does in this that's all we need basically. for a reason for him to be like he is in this movie I would say that the one thing that Khan does that I wish he hadn't done yeah. was when he thought all seventy two torpedoes full of his people were aboard his ship uh -huh. at that point um, didn't know they were going to detonate didn't know they were going to detonate. He sends Kirk back and then tries to blow up the Enterprise. I don't buy that. I, I really don't buy that for Khan because he thinks he has what he wants. And Kirk has so far helped him to get what he wants. But I, I don't know. I don't but see he, why he has to, he has to try to Even in the original him. continuity, he gets... He, he thinks he's getting what he wants, but then there, it's going to blow up on him. The Genesis device is going to blow up on him. And then he thinks he can get... Kirk at the same time in original continuity, and you know uh, the difference is he has a personal vendetta against. Kirk I know, I realize but he doesn't that. Here. I, I I understand. He has that. already killed the one man that he hated so much, right? By blowing over. up his skull with his own hands. He's already I know, done that. That was a crazy scene, too. By the way, um, I'm sorry. Let's unless there was more we need to talk about with no, that. No, I, I think we're good. Um, Sarah, you have some some issues that I think we should bring up uh, that you were telling me about yesterday um, about Khan just being too much of a Superman. Yes, hmm. I think I think the problem is that in the original series, I know that they couldn't do all the effects they wanted with with Khan. Uh, I would say that he should be about on the level of a Vulcan, whose strength is what five times that of a human. I think it's like three, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Hmm. So I I could see him being a match for Spock. Back right. in the original series, whereas Kirk should not really actually have been able to beat him in a fist fight. Yes. This, this Khan, who would beat him, ever? I mean, he's he's just he just is a Superman. I I don't see genetics being res alone being responsible for what he turned into. I I can see that, but there there is a scene where basically Spock is overpowering him, even just a little bit, but it's not much. But as far as being on par with a Vulcan, it's kind of just hinted at for a little bit. Well, it's not just hinted at. I mean, like like Spock Spock rails on nearly him nearly wins him that up. fight. Yeah. But I guess what I guess what Sarah is saying, um, Spock shouldn't have been that powerful. Yeah. yeah from what, well, we, see from what Khan, we see of Khan yeah. earlier. It just isn't consistent. Yeah, right. If when we when we see him in in earlier scenes like fighting the Klingons, or 
uh, fighting aboard the Admiral's ship. It's just the just the things he can do here and there in between that it's it does it makes him seem too powerful. And so I think that at the end when we get when when I saw Spock clinging to the side of that car thing trying to climb up, I saw Khan walk over and about to step on his face, and I was like, "There's no way Spock should have been able to climb up on there. Khan should have just." kicked him off and been done. And that is somewhat of a, to be fair, somewhat of, an, of a more action-oriented thing where it's, mm-hmm. well, yeah, but don't you want to see Khan that powerful? And I think that's the problem. And the problem is, yes, but it can't defy common sense. And, and it shouldn't why. defy Khan either. Yeah. Like, there's no, there's no reason that all of a sudden in this continuity he should be so much stronger than he was in the original continuity. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I enjoy that we get so many more examples of his strength. I mean, even yes. in Wrath of Khan, we don't get to see him do all that much more than, like, lift up a guy by his lapel or something. We see more of his um, intellect in Wrath of Khan. not lapel, but by the handle that Chekhov has on his yeah. spacesuit. We see more of his intellect in Wrath of Khan than we see anything else. Yeah, and, and here it's, it's certainly reversed. Yes. And that's... But he has so a like, lot of good intellect in this one, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm sorry, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely does. Um, so... I think it's. I want to mention a couple of things that um, that I found out about the production of this film. Um, one of them is that uh, they were they they uh, thought when they finished the, when they were making the first movie that they might do Khan in the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was they, they actually nearly. I didn't tell you about this. They actually nearly put in a shot at the end of the first movie of the Botany Bay to set it up. Oh wow! They nearly did it. That's crazy. Which I kind of wish they'd done, just because it, nobody would have been surprised, and that it would have been. Then we would have all been expecting Wrath. Should start Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan anyway. Yeah, although maybe it was smarter they didn't. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, would, I don't know. I would. I would bet money that what we would have gotten had they done that would have just been thrown us into all a tizzy. Um, well, I don't know if just just th- showing us Botany Bay would have meant that we wouldn't have gotten the exact same film we just got. Oh, that's um, true. You know, because they were already kind of thinking about Khan. The thing is, the thing is, before this movie starts, they found the Botany Bay. That's consistent with what we just watched. Right. There's no reason had they shown us that shot, we wouldn't have gotten this exact same that's film. That's true. Um, so I'm of two minds about it. I wish we could have seen cool. the Botany Bay. I though. wish we'd seen it too. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, but anyway. Uh, even even knowing that maybe they were going to do Khan, what's interesting is they formulated this whole plot with the evil admiral and, and Section 31 and all of that without Khan. Yeah. Which is really cool. But, but I mean, like, 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 like production-wise, they, Abrams, Abrams has come out and said now, um, we could have done this movie without Khan. Like, 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 thematically, it's the same movie. Yeah. Khan yeah, adds Khan some things, been any, but, but, um, but in a lot of ways, he could have kind of been anybody, and, and, and they, and they recognized that. Yeah. Um, I think that, it, again, I think it's important to note that, that Khan is not the main villain here. Not only is he not the main villain, but I'll, I'll harp on it again just this once. It's kind of as if they did this movie without Khan, as we know Khan. One one of the other things um, that I think is an interesting to note is that they they named him uh, John Harrison based on the name that he that Khan almost was in an early draft of Space Seed, mm-hmm. and th- th- he was going to be a totally different nationality. He was going to be a whole different thing, and they uh, and and his name was uh, Erickson, um, a weird spelling of Erickson, and I forget what the first name. What was it? I think it was Harold, Harold something. I, th- I think it was Harold. Harold Erickson. It was something like that, and. Um, Elle and I were talking about this, Brandon, um, mm-hmm. where, where like, uh, uh, she had looked at, at that early script at one point, I don't know how she found it, but she, but she found it, and she mentioned to me, she said, um, if this turns out to actually be Khan, and John Harrison, um, is, is, uh, is just his pseudonym, why didn't they use Erickson? Turns out, they did. They did? They, they not only scripted it with Erickson, but they shot it that way, and at the last minute, um, uh, Abrams decided that, um, it was... Too, it would have given too much away if anybody knew about that script. He was afraid that it would have that, that people ah. would have figured out Khan too early, and that would have gone all, all over the internet. Um, but he, so he second guessed himself. So what's really interesting is when anybody in this movie calls him Harrison, they have gone back and eighty yard Harrison into everybody's mouths. I see. On set, they all said Erickson. Oh, I think that's wow. really interesting. That is really interesting. Um, I wish they'd just done it because I think that was that would have been really cool. Yeah, and I think. That it actually almost uh, makes makes it makes me think that they really should have showed the Botany Bay 
at the end of the first movie because then they wouldn't have worried about that and then we would have gotten it. They wouldn't have worried about trying to keep Khan a secret. Um, the other, the only other really giant important thing that we haven't really talked about, um, I mean, I, I guess there's a lot in this movie. There's tons of things that, yes. that, that we could that we could go to, um, that 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 we need to talk about before we talk about little things. Um, is what do we think about all of the Wrath of Khan homage or rehash or however you want to look at it, depending on whether you like it or you don't like it? And I think it's only fair to let Sarah start because she doesn't like it at all. No, I don't like it. I'm going to. Let's see. Let's see. You called it homage or rehash, or I'm going to call it stealing. I'm. <laughs> uh, see, I don't know. Go, I don't know. Go, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I, okay. I really, really disliked that. I think the problem is that there's no, there is no reason to to rehash that that we saw. It it, it it's too on the nose for me. Wrath of Khan was a fantastic, phenomenal movie. And Agreed. that scene where Spock sacrifices himself for to save the ship, and the, the moments that Kirk and Spock had before his death were fantastic. And you you can't copy that emotional resonance. I don't think, and I don't think it should be tried. I really don't. And I think what they did here, if you've seen Wrath of Khan, it turned into a cheap imitation. You knew what they were doing, and my problem wasn't that they homaged it, but that they played it scene by scene of what happened. Yeah, frame by frame. Frame by frame by frame is what I mean. And it's a scene. It's, you can't say yeah, scene by scene. Yeah. So, so frame by frame, they they had they had like the whole setup. They had all the dialogue. They had the the the, the hands on the glass. They had it, it was just it made it predictable. And when it's something's predictable, you're looking for things and saying, oh, this should be here next because that's how they did it before. And you're not really emotionally invested. And it especially doesn't work because I personally called that they weren't going to leave Kirk dead. As soon as I saw him go into the radiation chamber, I said, oh, magic blood. And so it just, the scene carried no weight for me at all. Okay. Real quick, I've got to say that um, I'm of two completely opposite minds on this. Um, I'm I'm like two, I'm like Captain Logan and Mirror Captain Logan. <laughs> <laughs> Which one has the beard? Um, both of them, <laughs> but one of them only has a goatee, and the other one has a full blown beard. Okay. Um, so regular Captain Logan, my normal self, says. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, the 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 regular me watching it the second time goes. It's a little fanficky. Uh, like, like I get that it's an alternate continuity, and that you you could you could use the, I guess I guess this is a you could use this flimsy argument of the universe is more or less resetting itself so that things happen this happens sort of kind of like they did before, um, except that it's years and years before it happened in the first place. And but then you could also say, well, these two guys are they're 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 a little different, but they're still to the core who they were in the original mm -hmm. continuity so maybe this is the so, still sort of the conversation they would have um you know you know that kind of thing um but then the crazy mirror side of me loved it and bought it hook line and sinker because i'm a complete idiot and the reason i'm a complete idiot is because the first time i watched it i was actually I, don't, I can't believe I did this. I was so invested um, in Kirk, and I was and I, and, and I was liking the movie so much more than I thought I would. I think part of the problem was I didn't expect to like it at all. So then suddenly it it it, it, gra it grabbed me. I mean, I forgot I was wearing 3D glasses. I can't see in 3D. I hate wearing 3D <laughs> glasses. I mean, I almost forgot about I, it. I was sitting next to you, and I was like, he is he is involved in this movie. It was ser It was yeah, really serious. And I forgot about the blood. And I actually thought for about five minutes, maybe they were going to keep Kirk dead. I really actually bought it, and that made that scene okay, because if Kirk really, if you think at any moment, and at the end, him him not dying doesn't change it, be, didn't change it for me the first time watching it, just because, well, they maybe think that maybe he would die, um... Maybe that's the exchange I wanted if he actually dies, even if it's so verbatim. The and, and then even Spock yelling Khan didn't bother me because uh. I thought, because I thought that. So uh. the second time watching it, the blood thing it's it's set up so early and so clearly, and I was just like, okay, if I wasn't and and don't take this the wrong way because I'm not yeah. calling you stupid. I'm just saying that I, I I thought the second time watching this. Oh, so if Captain Logan wasn't stupid, he wouldn't have liked this as well. That's right. that's where that's where my head was. Okay. Well, I've got something to say about this. I've got a few things to say. Basically, I did remember the blood, 
but it still worked for me. And here's why, because it's kind of like a paradox. You can't just straight up, it would have worked if you had kept him dead, but it would have been like, oh, well, they kept Spock dead at the end of Wrath of Khan. They're going to keep Kirk dead at the end of this movie. That I would have been less okay with. And then with. you could rename the film so that Star Trek, so it's Star Trek II, The Wrath of Spock. <laughs> and then the third one is Star Trek III, The Search for Kirk. Hey, <laughs> yes, but then what I did like is the fact that they didn't leave him dead. Now, the scene where he dies is still powerful for me because I remember the scene in The Wrath of Khan. I think that's why it worked for me, is because I remember this scene and how emotional that scene is for me. This scene was very emotional for me, too. Well, what Sarah's saying is it's not believable that they that they would have the same dialogue like that. I understand that. problem is that... That's a in, bit hokey. It's almost like the emotional resonance <clears throat> from that scene is trying to draw too much from the original great masterpiece. Yeah, you're... You know, I'm just saying... Understandably. What they're saying is this movie's not good enough... So we have to pull from the original to and, make things work. And I love that you say it that way because some that's that is the most positive way to put it because so many people that don't like no, because so many people yeah. that don't like this movie are saying it thinks it's better than Wrath of Khan. No it doesn't. No it doesn't. Actually it's it doesn't. the exact opposite. It thinks it's gotta be Wrath of Khan yeah. because what's there isn't good enough. I disagree. I think the movie is fine just the way it is. I don't think it needed all that. Now I'm not saying that even without that it's it's as good or better than Wrath of Khan. I'm just right. saying that they're like yeah. I think you're right. I hadn't thought about it like that. We're like, the movie's not giving itself enough credit, maybe, no, by doing not. that. And I don't think it is. It, it takes me out because of it. It's like watching Wrath of Khan through a mirror darkly. Mm -hmm. You know? Where you're, right, watching, you're, you're, you're watching this scene, but you're not actually thinking Kirk's dying and, and Spock's outside the glass going to live. You're thinking, oh, I remember that fantastic scene from Wrath of Khan, and how how is Kirk being Spock. Actually, I I disagree there. I, I knew what they were drawing from, but I wasn't thinking Wrath of Khan at the moment. I was thinking, my God, are they really, like, this This to me was working for me, and I know I, I differ on that from, I'm sure, a lot of people out there, but it... It, it was really interesting to me, and I thoroughly enjoyed that scene. I thought that they, even though we had the setup of Khan's blood, I thought they could still kill him. I thought that they would end it with him dead. I was still there. And then I was like, I, but I, I knew that they could bring him back with Khan's blood. Rand, I want to ask you this yes. question. Because uh, as I said, I'm of two minds about it. Right. I mean, like, I, 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 I'm kind of, you know, I'm leaning more towards Sarah sometimes. And then with you, I'm remembering the way I remember. I, I saw it the first time and right. could not believe that this movie made me okay with Spock yelling Khan. But it kind of invested. Did. That's worth something yeah. for you. No, 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 it is. Absolutely it is. But let me ask you this question. Yes. You and I are saying that we enjoyed that scene as Star Trek fans. Yes. I really resist the number of people who are going to see this movie who have not seen Wrath of Khan and might later see Wrath of Khan. I feel that the same me. way. Oh, thank you. you see what because, I'm saying? Oh, my it God. I, me. I, because I told I somebody don't think else. You can't have the experience with Wrath of Khan. You should if you've seen that scene. Right. You, not and only, that's the thing I dislike not, the most about not it. Not only that, but I was telling a friend, if you go to see this movie, watch Wrath of Khan first. Yeah. I told, I straight up told him, I said, if you haven't seen it in a while, or you just vaguely remember, I said, watch it first. Because this movie, it does pull from it, yes. But you, you can't have the investment for those scenes. When you go back and watch you that movie. Yeah, but you, you can't have it for this new movie. You can't even have it for the new movie if you don't know what happened in the first movie. That's what I'm thinking. Well, that's interesting because Sarah's saying that she can't be invested in it because she's already kind of heard this dialogue before. I can understand that. I can see that. But if right. you're watching, yeah. if you're watching this movie, it, it's twofold. You watch this movie first, and then you go back to Wrath of Khan. You're not going to have an investment in Wrath of Khan because it's just like, well, they did it this way, and I kind of like I saw this one first. You know, yada yada. yada. Although it'll blow you away that they keep Spock dead at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's that's well, true. Well, there's no magic blood in, in Wrath of Khan. That's Con. true, but at the same time, if you haven't seen the original Wrath of Khan, you lack a very particular understanding about this new film. It's fundamentally gone because you you don't have it, and that's that's why I would encourage anyone who's going to see this film to watch Wrath of Khan first. Do it that way. Do it the way the, the way it came out. Wrath of Khan came out first and years ago. Watch it. One of the best movies I've ever seen. Let me uh, let me also say the other reason that I'm a little bit more okay with that stuff that I probably ought to be, mm -hmm. and that's because 
now that we have gone full throttle, we did Wrath of Khan again, kind of, but uh, luckily they subverted my expectations more than I thought they would in Khan's right. not the villain. Um, now that we've full throttle done it, we'll never do it Again, Again. Right. Um, Nemesis rips from Wrath of Khan all over the place. I, I, like, like, like they said when they put that movie together, Shinzon is going to be Picard's Khan. Well, he's Picard's clones, so that's stupid. Uh, you have to spell clone with an H now. Uh, but, but then, but then you go to uh, you go to you go to Star Trek Eleven, and this movie that sets up their version. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not really their version of Wrath of Khan, but I mean their their movie with Khan in it. Is already homaging Wrath of Khan in a lot of places. The the first thing that Leonard Nimoy Spock says to Kirk in the 09 Star Trek movie is, I have been and always shall be your friend. Yeah. Um, and then they have, like, the uh, the creatures that they put in Pike's mouth that are definitely homaging oh, the, the, yeah. the, the set of eels. eels. Oh, you, yeah. see, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. We cannot get away from Wrath of Khan. We have this, we have this idea that Wrath of Khan that. being one of the greatest things in Star Trek, it's the only thing in Star Trek. And, and, and luckily, we finally did a movie. <laughs> we got it out of our system. They'll never do it again. Okay. We hope. Now, I had to say this. Breaking from Khan and the theme of Khan throughout the film, there's something we haven't really touched on that we need to. Did you get to dog on that as hard as you wanted to? Because Well, we didn't talk about Spock yelling Khan. But... I'm sorry. Let her do okay, that. Okay, <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I, I was okay with that, but go ahead. Why? Just that go, is tell not, me. Just that keep, is keep not going. Spock. My wife does a facepalm. I've never seen my wife facepalm. The Picard facepalm. No, I have facepalmed myself every time I have heard somebody bring that up. During this discussion, she's been doing it. I've been okay. doing it. I did it in the theater. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. Okay, I realize this Spock has a few more emotions. I realize that I was scene okay was very that. emotion emotional. Yes, I loved the part where Kirk says, "Spock, I'm afraid." Tell me how not to be afraid. Homage. And Spock's there. We, we, what we was great though him. was that, that I'm sorry, that line there wasn't just homage though. That that's also like like tied into it's everything tied into thematically the in the movie. Yeah. 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 And then 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 it zooms to Spock and he's crying and yeah. says, I don't know how to do that now. That was fantastic. Yeah. I wish they'd left it at that. So so Kirk dies. You see Spock starting to get angry, and in the theater, I knew it was coming. Just because, at first I was like, why is he getting so angry? And I, I said to myself, mm. there's only one thing they, thing they could possibly be gearing up for, and they better not do it. And, and they then did it. they did it. And the problem is that not only is it paralleling Wrath of Khan, just like yeah. that whole scene did, but it's pulling from something that is, it, it is so different from the context of Wrath of Khan that it makes no sense. Explain that, because I, I, I don't know that Brandon remembers it okay, the way that, that, I think that the do. only reason they did that was because it's become a cultural thing and an internet meme, and everyone knows that you're supposed to yell Khan. But in the original Wrath of Khan, the reason that Kirk yells Khan is to try to fool Khan right. into thinking that he has outsmarted Kirk. He, Kirk is not actually... Emotional. Well, he's not that, losing his like, cool. He's, yeah, right. He's not in, internally emotional. He is. He is overtly emotional to fool Khan. He well, knows, he's saying. He, yeah, in the original, he's basically saying, "It's not them you want. It's me you want. You know, come after me." And he's like, and then he, and then he yells it out. I, I can see yeah, what you're but, saying. But everybody except Kirk. No, no, this is the buried alive scene. Yeah, the the buried yeah. alive. Yeah. So everybody except Kirk thinks they are. Oh no, you're actually, right. You're right. You're yeah. gonna have to come down here. Yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah. wants so, him down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone in this scene except for Kirk. And I will go on. Thinks hurting you that Kirk and company are going to be buried That's alive. That's another thing with, I have. A... Without anybody to save them for a very long time. So Khan thinks he's left Kirk buried in a hole underground. And zooms off to find to capture the Enterprise, so okay. that he won't know about I, the uh, about the the uh, the plan he's got because he knows how to get out already, right. exactly. and he hasn't told anybody because Kirk's awesome like that. Yeah, and so they go tour the little um, underground Genesis room, and they come back, and everyone's like, "Oh, well, now I guess we're trapped, so we we better get ready to die." And Kirk's like, "Flip open communicator." Well, no, they got rations okay, for stuff. years. I mean, yeah. they're going to live. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So Kirk flips open and his communicator, too, as I remember, and says, "Oh yeah, yeah, hey Spock." You're there. And they have a whole and, ecosystem. And he, and he comes gets them. Like, yep. he That's knows it. that they're they're good. Yeah. You reminded me of something else that I have to mention, and that is uh, Khan, had, Khan has a great speech in Wrath of Khan just before he dies 
where he says, "I stab at thee." You know, he's yeah. He's he, quoting Moby Dick, right? He, but he's got this—he's got this great scene. I should say it's a great scene in which he quotes. Now, Khan has an okay line in this movie, but it just—and it, granted, he's not the main—he's not a main villain in this movie, but it just didn't have the power. He not, also doesn't die, though. That's true. He also doesn't die, but he just doesn't have the power. He goes, he says, every captain should go down with his ship. Mm -hmm. And that's an okay line, but it just didn't have the power behind it that I remembered in the original. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't have a problem with that because he's, again, he's not the main villain, and uh, I was excited they didn't kill him. And, I mean, he's, he's, put, he's put back in stasis, and if they... I hope they don't do another movie with Khan, but if we were to get Me lucky too. and they did a TV show somehow... I mean, I feel like if we ever did a, I feel him. like if we ever did a TV show, we'd have to recast everybody because most of these actors are too big. But uh, but, but I'm just saying that if they that, that if they did something in this universe on television, um, we've got an out to do Khan again. And Cumberbatch at least is a television actor, so we could get him back. Probably that's recently. true. But I would say this: I I could. It would be like if they gave the actors leeway to do other things. In the midst of a television series, they might, some of them might go for it. Yeah, but a lot of them wouldn't. I know, I realize that. But one, okay, breaking from this, yeah, yeah, there's sure. one thing we haven't talked about that I really feel that we need to, and that's the introduction of Carol Marcus. Yeah, we do need to talk. We about We need that. to talk about that because that was big. And even though she would, you said she sounded Australian or she was Australian. I just didn't understand that. It's not I, I, I loved her character. Well, see, the thing is, everyone actually deep down wants to be Australian and have an Australian accent. <laughs> oh, I know, I do. So she she <laughs> grew up and she decided, I don't want to be have an American accent. So she practiced her Australian accent, went to school in Australia, and now she's she's got it down. Right? All they had to do was tell us where she was from. I mean, just to, <laughs> like, like maybe she came from someplace else, or maybe maybe she spent a lot of time someplace. I don't know why. I, I'm just saying. I thought it was strange that they did things like that. And didn't talk about them. They were just that way. But whatever. Yeah. It's not that well, big of a deal. I thought she was it's a great not that though. big of a deal. I thought she was fantastic. I thought the way they introduced her was great. I thought her being a weapons expert was yes. fantastic. What a good great. idea. Because the Genesis torpedo was a torpedo. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I have a question for yeah. you though. Sure. A question. You said you saw an interview with her, in which what 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 did they label her as? What was her character's name? Carol in? Wallace. Carol Wallace, which they is in the movie. Right. They mentioned that. I, that's right. something I just wanted to bring up was that they do mention that in the movie, and I thought that was based on what you had said. You'd seen that interview, and you're like, well, the, you you knew they were going to be doing Car Carol Marcus. I was like, I thought that was interesting where they have that line. You know, she tries to get on there as Carol Wallace. Mm -hmm. She goes, well, Wallace is the, he, and Spock's like, well, Wallace is the surname of your right. mother. Your father is. Um, that's actually one of my irritating nitpicks that I was going to mention at the end. Really? Uh, yeah, okay. because it's way too easy for people to get on starships they don't belong on in this, in this series. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, I see where you're going with that. We can save that for the nitpicks. Yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, that's annoying. But right, I, 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 loved, I loved her, back, the background that we got for her in a good, it, it was well paced for us to learn about her. And when when Kirk says, "When were you going to tell me about her?" He's like, "When right. it became relevant." I think Which that did. I, yeah, think, just, I think Carol Marcus is um, a character that is cool for us being Star Trek fans. Mm -hmm. I completely understand the people that are not into Star Trek that don't know who that is or don't care who that is who are saying, "Well, she didn't even need to be in the movie." Um, I'm hearing a lot of that from people mm -hmm. where folks are like, "Are like, well, she she's not developed. She's just kind of there." Here's the thing. Um, I'm I, I, I appreciate that, but I will also take up for it for a couple reasons. The mm -hmm. first big one is it's kind of fun just to get some new blood on that ship yes. for later movies or possible Absolutely. other things. Um, I, I think it's I think it's a neat different thing to do to have Carol Marcus be a regular crew member on the five year mission. I like and that. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to see the development of their relationship? She and Kirk would will Absolutely. eventually have to get together. Yeah. And I and I would I would hope that they would get together and maybe maybe eventually if the series would go that far have a child together. I think it's Absolutely. fantastic. Um, it's a oh, that's wonderful really cool. idea. The notion of the thing that made me most impressed with her was the motion was the notion of Carol Marcus used to be a weapons expert. She gets older and then she uh, takes that and she tries to use it to create life. Mm -hmm. And it actually adds something to that character that we didn't have before. And but if you don't, the... if you don't know Star Trek, you you wouldn't get that. you wouldn't get it. But it also adds the brightness of the future, knowing what she later becomes in the. And in the isn't Rapid it Con. neat that she is the daughter of a guy who's obsessed with the military and trying to turn Starfleet into military? Exactly. And he, he wants war, and she's a weapons expert who doesn't want war. I think it's fantastic. Absolutely, I I would I would absolutely agree with you on this. And it's just she has she 
is almost more nuanced than what we get out of our con in this. Oh, well, she, she absolutely is, but she's also not on screen that much. <laughs> I know, but I... I loved what we got of her. I, I absolutely fully, loved it. I fully expected a full-blown um, love affair with her and Kirk in this movie, and I think it's cool that they saved it. I think it's cool that they saved it, too, because it would have been too fast-paced yeah. for this movie that had great and even pacing for me. For me, too. Sure, absolutely. It was just, it yeah, was good. I thought she was fantastic. And I really liked the scene with with her and Bones trying to unlock that That was that funny. That was, and that was Bones awesome. is like, when I envisioned being on a planet with a pretty woman, like... There wasn't a torpedo. There wasn't a torpedo. Was yeah, and that is a line that you easily could have seen DeForest Kelly deliver. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. I thought most of his dialogue was DeForest Kelly dialogue. It was It was really good. I mean, this is this, these are a couple of things we're able to actually have all consensus on. Oh, sure, That's yeah. great. This well, movie pulled us together on an issue. Yeah, well, I feel like um, the three of us aren't that far off. We're not. No. I think there's a, a bit of a range, but it's not. Sure, yeah. <laughs> One of us absolutely hates it, and the other one, and someone else thinks it's perfect. I feel like unusually I'm right in the middle of you guys. But like... we, had, we, we ran the gamut today. Yeah. You, you had uh, kind of major pro. There were some things that were major problems for you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. You are in the middle on the fence... And here's me being like, I... This is great! <laughs> Brandon turned into a Pokemon watching this movie. This is, this is great! <laughs> like, yeah, this is awesome! Um, yeah, I mean, you are kind of in the middle of this on this one. Well, just for fun, and again, I, I don't want people to feel like we're, we're, we're doing this to like, to like you know... Can you know, I start with bring this? The, yeah, you, absolutely, you can. Okay. To, to, to bring the movie down, again, we just went round table and reminded you, this is what each of us feels like, you know, broad spectrum on this movie. Yeah. Uh, but, there are number of little irritating gripes, and I think it might be fun to uh, go around, uh, well, yeah, let's do that, let's go around the table a few times, and yeah. just see if we can throw some of them out, out there, because there's, there's some fun stuff. Um, you start, Brandon. Okay, I'd like to mention we are actually sitting at a round table We are, as it's, well, it's round, so. it's true. Alright, uh, so one of my nitpicks would have to be, uh, and by the way, I loved the cinematography and the look of sets on this. Uh, I was, I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. We've got to say that real quick. One one of the one of the best things about this movie is that you can see everything. You can see everything. The lens there was still lens flare, but it wasn't overbearing like in the first one. People would not have but made that, fun of it as hard as they did. That's true. If it looked like but that. But the look of these sets. Yeah. I dig the Enterprise. Me like, too. I like it now. Is Freaking cool! Yeah, and the the, the stuff that they have when, when you can see on the doors, you see where it says airlock one mm -hmm. or like turbo lift, and the way those doors come together, and the, and the well placed sound effects, with the exception of all the punching that goes on, and the punching sound effects were terrible. By the way, <laughs> it was way too Is meaty, that your crunchy. That, Is that's that your one nitpick? of my nitpicks. Okay, all right. So uh, that, like that, the, most of the sound effects were great, including when. Uhura has to get Spock back on the horn and she's flipping the switches and you hear the clicks like in the old show. Mm -hmm. It's just really great. And then she throws down her earpiece and you can hear it hit the ground. There's some good stuff in there. But okay, so going back, my, my main nitpick would be is Kirk is in the uh, the warp core, which was a beautiful warp core. It was really first class. He's in there and he's trying to realign the dilithium crystals. There is no leverage on the position in which he is standing. And in fact, you can even you can even see that the lithium crystals move the opposite direction when he's basically kicking from the top of this tilted side going the other direction. He should have been down next to it with his feet pressed up against it trying to kick it rather than too. rather than hanging like a damn I never like about a that. darn monkey. Oh, Brandon. Like yeah. a darn monkey trying to be like and he's basically stomping it in the wrong direction. That was a nitpick, but I loved that scene other than the fact that he was on the wrong end of trying to, to realign it. Not only that, but a ship that sophisticated better have an auto mechanism for realigning that thing. Like, there's got to be some sort of servo motor that, like, oh, the warp core is out of alignment. We don't have to decontaminate this thing and go in there We're ourselves. Kill a guy. Yeah. yeah, we just need to be like get get to the manual override servos and just spin the wheel so that we can turn the gears that will realign this thing. That's a nitpick. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally noticed that, but I I didn't bring that up last night when we were talking about yeah. uh -huh. nitpicks. Okay, uh, here's here's a big one for me. Uh, when we go to Kronos. 
um, you know, you mentioned Uhura. We go to Kronos. Yeah. Um, I want to know why, with all of the fantastic uh, technology, including we figured out how to intraspace beam in this universe, mm-hmm. we don't have a universal translator. What's that about? Yeah. Um, with and and again, you could say, well. Because of the changes in the timeline, we've got some some of our technology is more advanced. Other things are less advanced. But guys, again, this is a nitpick. Inter- Enterprise is canon. Yeah. Enterprise not only developed the Universal Translator throughout the series, but it pretty much worked with about every language they knew of by fourth season. And one <laughs> of the first languages they figured out with it was Klingon. What is Klingon? So, so really, they did it so we could have some Klingon language in this movie. I mean, that's that's why they did it. That's the only reason they don't have Universal translators in this. Apparently, that, that's yeah. that's that's interesting. You guys I, yeah. Okay. This is this is a nitpick, and okay, it totally took me out of the movie and really surprised me when the ship started falling toward Earth. When what? it got caught in yeah. Earth's gravitational pull. Uh-huh. I thought they were way too far away from Earth. Who would ever stop that close to Earth to be in the danger of falling to Earth if, well, no, the, well, if they got not? A standard it? orbit would would make you it fall to Earth. It would decay over time. It, it wouldn't make you plummet like a rock. But if you're... They, they weren't exactly in a standard orbit. An orbit will keep you up there. They were stopped next to Earth. Is is what I got. Is they they were but pretty much still, yeah, they were at a standstill. S- even if they were at a standstill, you would still pl- you would not plummet. It, the, the gravitational pull is not is not strong, su- enough. strong enough at that point to just suck you down. And plus, they didn't show a, a reentry. Nor, there's there's friction. And oh, you're right. The they didn't show, show. it. You just show you, you just plummeted straight down from no. Like, they, they, the there moon. was a definite reentry where they start to to burn the Enterprise. Pieces of it come burning off of the Enterprise. Where, I, I yeah, missed that, that, that part. there's a and great then, scene where you start to see the Enterprise. Basically, the Enterprise starts to fall towards it, mm-hmm. and they're talking about how they're going to incinerate. And then you see pieces of the hull plating come off, and you see mm-hmm. things heat up and start to burn. There is actually okay, a pretty I, good. I scene. missed that one. It's but, very short, but it is. And there. then the problem is that it's falling in. Every scene that I noticed, it seems to be falling flat toward Earth and like rotating laterally as it falls. But inside, everybody's tumbling all over the place. They're tumbling all over the place because when they were still in the, they were still in space mostly at those points. And we're seeing But then seeing there wouldn't that, be any gravity. It wouldn't s- s- I, suck you d- toward one I direction. Under- I understand that because where they are, if you lost all power, you're still going to be floating. You really are. Yeah, you'd, something so you'd that either big be floating might, or something you'd Something that be... big might be being, while it would be pulled towards the Earth, you as being on the ship are still going to be kind of in a floating way because gravity is not having that big an effect on you yet. Yeah. But regardless of all that, it was a lot of fun watching people walk on the on the sides of the wall. Yes, and it was cool. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just for the visuals that they did it, because oh, it physically yeah. it made no sense. Yeah. But on that note, I was kind of disappointed because they're, they, were, they were literally borrowing from Inception on that cage roll that they did. Oh, yeah. Sure. Where they're running through the corridors. Yeah, but it's they, a different situation. That would be like saying, oh, no one should ever do the bullet time special effect ever again just because Matrix did it. Oh, of course. You're, I, I you understand. Know, you're talking about movies inventing things that, are, that, that you can that use for other standard, situations. Yeah, sure. Basically. Um, okay, do you have another one? Uh, another nitpick that I would have, oh, what was, there was something else that I was, well, first of all, why does, why does Bones have a treble? Huh? D- I would assume that it was the same triple from the first movie that they just that had that was still Scotty dead. had. Maybe it. Well, it didn't. I thought there was a plot reason it died, but I can't remember now. I don't. Rem- I just think no, he- no, 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 no. He wasn't just dead. He was. Um, it, it dies when he tries to put the blood in it. Now, I, or wait, maybe no, not. it was dead. No, no, it was dead already. Okay, I don't know why he has. He wants that to know no why idea. Khan's blood regenerates the way it does. I I'm gonna like put it in this scene, I thought there was a scene missing, maybe or something, maybe. because because Kirk goes, Bones, what are you doing with that triple? And I was like, Kirk, how do you know he has a triple? He's on the bridge. He goes, Bones, what are you doing with no, that triple? He's in sick bay. No, he was on the bridge when he said that. No, he wasn't. I thought he was in sickbay. He was in was sickbay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't remember. Okay, I'm sorry. He's I, standing there. I thought tell- they were on comms when he no, said that. he's standing there in front of Khan, and he says to Khan, he said, I'm going to do everything I can to make you pay for what you did. 
but right now I need you. And Khan looks at him, and then he looks over. Bones, what you guys, are you doing with you, that You triple? guys, next time we see it, watch it closely and tell me if I'm... And let's, let's check and see who's right about this. Because uh-huh. I'm standing by that. I thought for sure Kirk was on comms when he said, when he said, Bones, what are you doing with that triple? No, he was right there in sick bay. Yeah, I, I thought he was too. I don't we'll think watch so. It again. I really don't we'll think you're right about that. But um, well, we'll hear in the comments. I'm sure people people will remember better than I do. Um, anyway, uh, so another Nick pick I would have. Yeah, but I'm um, with you. What was he doing with that triple? Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, Bones, what are you doing with that triple? This isn't really a nitpick, <laughs> but it was really nifty to me. They're using their communicators like we use our cell phones. Yeah, I like that. And we hadn't really seen anything to that extent where Scotty is completely, he's not on the ship, he's out on the town, and he's a communicator. And they're talking like, I like Kirk just called him up on the communicator. Yeah, yeah. Well, what was also cool was that uh, Pike uses it as a texting device. Mm-hmm. Because he, he opens up his communicator and he looks at it and then he says, oh, we've got to go here. Oh, there's a nitpick. Okay, my turn. Yeah. Um, can I have a turn? Yeah. Okay, my turn. Um, why do two things? First of all, why uh, do all of the commanders of Starfleet, when something crazy bad happens, meet at a scientific institute? And above ground. Because it's, yeah, I know, whatever. But, yeah, yeah, that makes sense too. But all I'm saying is, but this is a different point. Right, okay. But. At a scienti- at the, they mentioned Daystrom. Daystrom. Daystrom is a scientific institute. Why do they meet there? That doesn't make any sense. Second of all, I really don't think there should be a Daystrom, Daystrom institute, institute yet. Yeah. Because maybe Daystrom has done some things already that would warrant his having an institute. But if you go back and look at TOS, he doesn't look old enough to have an institute named after him. He's like 35 or 40. Like... He's, he's already got, I mean, he, he invents M5, uh, so apparently before he invents M5, he's already got a whole institute named after him, and that's where all the commanders of Starfleet meet when bad things happen. Is there any... It's men- really minor, is but it's any, hilarious. Is there any mention in regular con- in, in original continuity that Daystrom comes from a line of Daystroms who've done amazing things? No. In fact, we're in, in, in fact um, I'm almost... Po- well, I could be wrong about this. I'd have to look it up. I thought that we that we have had places where we, where we even see it as the, the, the Richard Daystrom Institute, but I could yeah, be wrong I about that. I think so. Huh. I think it is. Interesting. But anyway, TNG loved borrowing names and things from TOS. Mm-hmm. So it's that Daystrom. Yeah. Almost okay. positive. I gotcha. Yeah. Okay, nitpick I have. Okay. Of uh, the entire first scene of the movie. Okay, go, go, <laughs> go, go for broke, Sarah. Because honestly, Sarah angered me when she told me about all this because yeah. I love that scene and then but she was right okay and now it. I want to stab myself. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this is going to be a series of nitpicks and then I'm going to rewrite that scene. Okay, go okay. ahead. <laughs> okay, one, the Enterprise is underwater on a planet. Really? Okay, I had the problem in the first movie where the ship was made in Iowa on the ground. Right. And now it's in the ocean. So, really, that design looks like it's made to land? Really? I don't think so. I don't think that should be anywhere inside an, an atmosphere, ever. It's not like Voyager where it's sort of aerodynamic. And might achieve liftoff somehow. It's top heavy. It's, it would not design yeah. it like it's that. It's so top heavy. Yeah. Yeah. It it should not be underwater. If we'd seen landing gear, I would have been fine with it. Yeah, but yeah, it would have to unhook from the. Um, from All the we needed were, <laughs> were struts that pop out. No, no, it could be like it could be segmented, and they they pop out from the sides. Yeah. 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 No, they could. It could be segmented. They yeah, pop out. But like 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 uh, like old like forties and fifties like flying saucer movies where they have like struts that pop out of, of a flying saucer. Right. I when get it lands. that. Do, do it. Do it with. Do it with that. I mean, like. It is a saucer after all. Like <laughs> that'd be one heck of an homage to old forties and fifties sci-fi. That'd it's not crazy. any goofier than putting it underwater and having rockets underneath the ship. Like I, I realize that. I'm just saying I, I'd be, that'd be great. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Also, if they're having problems I'm taking sorry. it out of the ocean so that everybody sees it, how'd, how'd they get, they it, get in it in there? In there I, in the I had the same thing. Was it at I just night? have to say that was my point. When yeah. We were yeah, but I stole it. But it's part yeah. of this whole scene. It is. Okay. It is. <laughs> yeah. I had so the, the same so problem. I guess they must have put it there at night when everybody sleeps and nobody hears the loud splashing in the ocean. <laughs> or the engines. Or the engines, or anything. That or, something that big Because it was very atmosphere. loud when it came out of the water, too. Yeah. Actually, I, I can peg you on that. Okay. That's a huge ocean. They went to the middle of the ocean, <laughs> they go in there, and then they go near the volcano. Well, in that case, why not go away from it? Because the you've got to get out. Spock out due to the fact that you can't beam through that much heat. But then heat. why did they get so close <laughs> to the shore? 
Why weren't they always in the middle of the ocean so that they could just come out of it? Yeah, there's no there's no reason. But frankly, they that's true. Well, again, I guess for some stupid reason they couldn't beam. Yeah. Well, yeah. for some other reason so, they see, had to have another... Kirk and McCoy down there mm-hmm. in the in the village. Yeah, He's which, a, we, an which idiot. we don't know why. Uh, village raised. Yeah, 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 and it's in Minas Rest, so we don't know why that is. Yeah, um, exactly. So why couldn't they beam anything? They couldn't beam Spock out of the volcano. Because they sent Chekhov to engineering. That's <laughs> no, why. that's later. That's yeah. Maybe. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then so a volcano has the ability to destroy a whole planet. Well, quite frankly, uh, it could. You'd Even have to one have... of our volcanoes here on Earth is like. A... It would have to cause Sorry. volcanic activity all over the surface of the planet, rather than just in one point. I would assume. Well, we actually have a super volcano in the United States that could wipe out more than half of the United States alone. But they said it was going to take out the whole population of the real, entire planet. I realize that. It, it also possible, while improbable, that it's a Pangea-type situation. A little island on a big planet. Yeah. There could be explanations for this stuff, but, but we don't have them, the right. We're, My right. thought is, rather than put the Enterprise in the ocean, you just... Have it be in orbit, and if you have to send down a shuttlecraft, you send down a shuttlecraft rather than beaming. And if if you had that scene where the shuttle's over there, has Spock on the cord, the cord breaks, the shuttle gets damaged, has to return to the Enterprise, make it so that the Enterprise has to dip down itself within the atmosphere to actually beam Spock out so they can get close enough. And then you still get your great Enterprises in the atmosphere. Exactly. Uh You could have done that without going in the ocean. You know, it, it, it's causing all sorts of problems. It stands to reason also that you could have taken a shuttlecraft to that volcano and then set this thing to detonate in the volcano by dropping it out of the shuttlecraft and detonating it right before it yes. hit the thing. You could have done that. You don't yeah. have to have Spock hanging from a dangly yeah. grappler. Yeah. That is illogical. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I well, hate that so much of that doesn't quite work because I liked the idea, just the image of seeing the ship underwater, just That's because we've true. never introduced the ship that way before. You always expected the first the first time you see the ship in a Star Trek movie is supposed to be a big deal, and yeah. you usually see it in space. So to see it like that, I was just like, it was kind of fun. It was a different type of reveal. Yeah. But this brings me up on another nitpick that I will have about this volcano scene, <laughs> and that is the fact that you mentioned earlier that Spock is willing to die for an ideal, while Kirk is willing to die for a man. Yeah. That type of thing. Spock. Was, Spock knows the Prime Directive really well, and he starts quoting regulation about how you can't come out of the ocean. Look at the fact that he knows he's violating the Prime Directive by stopping this volcano in the first place. Why is he inside this volcano when he, he, know, he knows it's breaking a whole slew of Starfleet protocol? Yeah, what was the conversation Kirk had with him that, allowed, that, that made Spock okay with even being on the away team? Because he tells him, you can't come out of the ocean. It's, it's like, okay... It's almost as if they had a conversation that got him in there, but then he's like, okay, this is the last star. You got me here. You can't do this, too. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had a little bit, again, we're in mid-scene. I'm with you. But there's a little bit, I can see problems with that. Like the prime director clearly says, well, we know that you're not supposed to be there. Having, having said that, when they did all that, I was thinking, oh, they don't get the prime directive. And then when you have Pike say you weren't supposed to be there in the first place. That was the That's the problem. You know, when he says, Kirk, what did you want? And Kirk says, don't yeah. trust a Vulcan. Yeah. <laughs> See, you can't even answer the question. <laughs> um, yeah, how freaking fantastic was that guy? Um, uh, yeah, the, P- Pike honestly has what might, ult- and I, I'll say this, he has what might go down as one of my favorite speeches in Star Trek. Um, his, his speech to Kirk his in that speech scene is, is great. Really good. I was literally... I will say this. I was literally devastated when they killed him. I was, too. I was that too. was a very powerful scene for me. Um, and why did I care more about Pike's death than I did about the destruction of Vulcan? In the because <laughs> that was just... That was just... Bull crud right there. Yeah. Well, I, we don't have to go into it. I just thought it was really interesting that they spent so much time and gave us such such you know um, such an emotional moment with our with our mm-hmm. two leading guys uh, with the death of, of Pike, and I, I felt for them, and I felt for Pike, and then I, and I, I found myself after that scene thinking I didn't feel this bad when Vulcan exploded, and it's up and it's Vulcan. No, and I, I will say this though: that this was on the on the part of of. Uh, Bruce Greenwood's acting. He did a very great job, but what tied together his acting for what I saw on the screen was what Spock said later about what he was feeling when he died. 
And that made that made that scene it was of, a mind meld that wasn't just for the sake of a mind meld, and I kind of appreciated that. Right, and I but seeing the way he was looking when he was dying, and then hearing what he was feeling when he was dying brought it kind of full circle for me. Um, I do feel like let's get back to the nitpicks. I do feel like okay. um, we I, I, I ought to mention the 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 obvious, which is um, Khan. Like, like, even if you have, like, expanded what he's physically capable of doing mm-hmm. from original continuity, um, Khan is not Wolverine. Right. <laughs> um, his blood really shouldn't be able to bring people back from the dead. Um, I mean, like, like, it's even hard for me to buy that his blood would, like, rejuvenate people that, as much as it, mm-hmm. as it does. Like, mm-hmm. like, but, like, but, like, to bring stuff back from the dead, I don't know about that. Um, you know, when, yeah. when McCoy's all like, uh, you know, I've, I've never, I've never seen, um, I've never seen cells regenerate like this. I'm like, Khan has never regenerated before. He's never regenerated before. And there's nothing to tell us why it would be different in this continuity. Yeah, exactly. And again, I don't want to keep harping on that or beating a dead horse. I just thought that was weird. Yes, um, it, it is weird. I got another one. Yep. I want to more rapid fire these if I uh, can. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, this, this is very small. It was a line in passing about how Dr. McCoy... Um, gave a C-section to a gore. <laughs> yeah. Do it, Sarah. Okay. First of all, start, fe- the Federation and the Gorn didn't have very close relations, so it's unlikely, highly, that McCoy would ever have had the opportunity to get close enough to perform any kind of operation on a Gorn. Exactly. Uh, they're very territorial, very protective of their own. They don't get out much. <laughs> also, the Gorn are cold-blooded, they look sort of reptilian, so one can only assume they're gonna lay an egg. That they lay eggs <laughs> and not have live births. <laughs> right. Okay. So, I guess this Gorn was just having trouble laying eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Needed a C-section know. to lay an egg. Well, and then he's like, "Those suckers bite," which means he must have been there for a live birth, and that didn't make any sense. So, I mean, okay, oh, sure. Right, I, right. I guess I could see some reptiles having live births. But it's yeah. it's just unlikely. It's I'm, an extremely unlikely circumstance. It is highly illogical. Yes, improbable. Do um, you have anything else? Uh, actually, no. I can't think of anything off the top of my head other than what I've already mentioned. Um, I'm sure there's something, but I have to watch oh, it again. There's weird things like weird little things like uh, the, the at one point the Enterprise uh, comes out of high high warp and doesn't get ripped apart. Um, you shouldn't be able to do oh, that. Oh, yeah, and they make their left turn, right, they actually make a right turn in this situation. Yeah, but yeah, they come, they come right out of a warp field, and they don't get ripped apart. Hey, how you can't turn at warp, yet every time they warp, and when you see them in their warp path, they're doing this. Yeah, <laughs> you can't see me on this podcast, And again, I'm, I'm moving my hands back and this forth. This is not the first time... That's a nitpick. This is not the first time we've ever seen them do, do that in Star Trek. I mean, no. I, so whatever, I'm just saying, that was weird. And by the way, i got to say this because I forgot it earlier. I can't believe that this movie made me okay with a giant black ship that looks just like the Enterprise that's twice the size. It's called The Vengeance. And I actually got through this movie, and it, I didn't roll my eyes at it. It's it amazing. Interesting I was kind of okay with that. Um, features on it. That, 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 was, that was fun. Yeah, the gun turrets were, the kind of gun turrets were Those were stupid. <laughs> that's a nitpick, but I liked, how, I liked how it could shield its deflector with massive doors. Like you can, There's a part where you can see these oh, yeah, doors kind cool. of shut on that the deflector. Cool. Why don't they ever do that? Yeah, that well, cool. that's, that, um, that's a good thing, because yeah. your deflector is a major piece of technology. It makes perfect sense yeah. yeah but if we're explorers we gotta leave that stuff exposed um i don't think that just because you're a warship or just because you're not a warship means that you oh no they're hiding right. their deflectors no, that, that means they must anybody. be shooting us all the time well i have one more nitpick yeah go ahead okay at the very end of the movie uh-huh um kirk decides to recite the captain's oath i was gonna i was gonna mention that one yeah okay so the captain's oath is space the final frontier these are the voyages of the starship enterprise yeah that didn't make any the sense the five-year mission yeah what which we just this got is the, like apparently and apparently it's the longest anybody's been in space that was the thing we had about the five-year okay. mission that can't be the longest anybody's ever explored space we've had enterprise but Enterprise was on a, on a mission. Yeah, right? no, 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 that's not, we're not talking about Enterprise. We're talking about that was a hundred years ago. You're saying that from Enterprise to now, nobody's ever been in space long. For, okay, for, for I five see years, what you're really? saying. Yeah, I thought with, that was with as many silly. species as we see in this movie. That's we've right. never been out. It's five that's years. Five There's years. no way because it would take longer than that to get to certain places. Right. 
Yeah. We've, we've explored enough of space now, and we've got we see a lot of aliens. You're in this absolutely thing. right. There's no way. Yeah. So yeah, but that that's it. I, and I don't think space the final frontier is an oath at all. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it made sense for that to be the oath, that's not an oath. <laughs> mm -hmm. What is an oath? Yeah. I, Captain Kurt. Space I, the final frontier. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Um, okay, does anybody else have anything else you want to mention before we before we close up? Um, no, that's pretty good. We went a lot longer than I had anticipated. We went almost two hours. There's, there's, there's plenty in this. Anyway, um, I can't believe how much I like this movie. <laughs> Me too. I know we just ran the gamut and talked about all kinds of problems, but that's just but fun in, to do. In the I, end, I, I can't either. Like, I really What always it. matters more to me than anything. I never let little uh, little weird inconsistencies totally destroy a movie for me. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the character arcs were consistent. Mm -hmm. I cared about what happened to people. Right. And the villains, <clears throat> be they too simplistic or not, at, at least... What they did made sense, and why they did what they did made sense, and I just, for the most part, and I was, I was really, really happy and pleased by that. Um, so yeah, they had a cause and they stuck with it, absolutely. Yeah, and I like that it was a movie that actually had some themes and thinking parts to it, and a continuity that made sense and motivations we could follow. Not only that, but the, if there, if you could say there was an A and a B story to this. More more than any episode ever did, they really were tied together. It wasn't like one had just a similar theme to the other story mm -hmm. to to kind of bring it down to somebody's level. It was they really were intertwined in yeah, each all, impacted it, the other. Everything kind of worked together. Um well, I think that's all we have. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, thanks as always for listening to Geese Not Nerds, the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we will uh, see you down the road. I'm sure, uh, I, I mean, the three of us should come back and do something at some point. Um, so anyway, uh, but even separately, obviously, we'll, we'll all be on videos and we'll see you, we'll see you later on. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Sarah. And I'm Brandon. 